Amen. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 15, 13, I pray that God, oh, we'll do this all over again. Uh, in Romans 15, 13, some of y'all missed that and you didn't want to miss it. I pray that God, the source of hope, that's who God is. He is the source of hope, the author of hope. Hope, listen, hope is not a small thing. Hope is not, well, you know, maybe just feeling better. It's not just a, a don't worry, be happy type thing. Hope is powerful. And God, God wants you to have not a little bit of hope, but a lot of hope. Because Paul goes on to say this, God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what I want for you, that you will overflow with hope, that you personally would have an experience with hope, an experience with the author of hope, God himself. And then beyond a, an experience with hope, uh, that you would become to a point where you overflow with hope. This is my prayer for you today, that God would fill you with hope and he would fill you with hope to the point of overflowing with hope. That's so that everyone we come in contact with, we get to become hope givers. You, know, you can't give what you've not experienced. So first comes the experience of hope and then comes the giving of hope. And I've learned that 99.9% .9 of the people you come in contact with, if you say, can I pray with you? They'd be glad to let you pray with them. You can give hope a lot of ways. It can be a listening ear. It, it, your smile can give hope, right? Praying with, just this week, uh, just yesterday, I had the opportunity, met a man for the first time, and, uh, and as we were talking, he starts to tear up some things that have been going on in his heart, in his life, and so I just threw out there, listen, I want to be a hope giver. I want to be so filled with hope that everybody I come in contact with I'm going to spill out some hope on them. And so right there, I said, hey, can I pray with you? And again, 99.9% .9 of the time, everybody I ask, no matter where we're at, yeah, absolutely. Um, so right there in the public, he said, yeah, let's pray. We grabbed hands, we prayed. And you know what happened? I was just imparting a little bit of hope. This is what we all get to do. Today, in your bulletin, there's some little invites that say experience hope. And I asked you last week, would you join me in, in helping others experience hope as well? Throughout the course of this series, uh, you're going to be flooded with hope. And every week, we're going to learn what God's Word has to say about hope and the experience of hope that we're all called to. And, and you're going to meet somebody, a group of somebodies this week that desperately needs hope. And so just as a tool to help you, we've given you these. And of course, you can grab a many, many more. They're in the back. And you can grab more if you want more than just one. But, uh, you know, take these and leave them at a restaurant or, or a neighbor, somebody you meet that needs hope. You get to be a hope giver to somebody else. So find somebody this week and invite, invite them to come back with you next Sunday as we experience hope together. I used to walk on the top of this, this building right here, the event center. It used to be a gym. And uh, as the youth pastor for years here, it was my regular practice, not in the winter because, you know, it's cold. And skinny guys don't do well with cold. But when it got warm outside, um, I would make it my practice. Early in the morning, I'd come here and come out of my office. And I would walk up the stairs. I would start walking around the roof of this, this gym. It enabled me to see more of the city. Um, and one of my prayers was, Lord, will you make this place a center of hope? Everybody needs hope. And you know, God has done it. God has made, Mount Hope is not just our name. Hope is who we are. Hope is what we give. Hope is who we are as a family. And I continue to pray that God would continue to make us a center of hope for others. You know, the opposite of hope is fear. We learned last week that fear is the expectation that something bad is going to happen to you. That's what fear is. Hope is the expectation that something good is going to happen to you. It's the eager expectation to not, have, to not have hope and to walk in fear, we said, is to have more faith in the devil's ability to do you bad than God's ability to do you good. That's why Paul said, in a quick reminder from last week, Paul said in Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him 
for what he's done. Don't worry about anything. I think in the midst of the, the culture we live in, when we hear about terror attacks and injustice and anger and all the ugliness that we hear about all the time, I'm thinking it's easy for a person to worry. I think if you just, if you just watch the uh, advertisements for prescription medications, that could make you worry. Have you ever paid attention to what they say? They call them common side effects. Common. It's not common. Co common side effects. It's so natural. Common side effects are possible stroke and heart attack and depression, suicidal thoughts, and possible death. In, in the commercial, they should be smiling. Hey, sign me up. How do I get to? Oh, how do I get that? How do I get that in me? You know, what's, wow, I read one that said one of the side, common side effects is falling asleep during your daily activities. <laughs> Goes on to say that uh, it has been reported that people have fallen asleep while driving a motor vehicle and it has resulted in an accident. Just a common side effect. Isn't that wild? And yet people, listen, there's a time when, when if you have to take medication, you have to take it. But there's a lot you can do for yourself. I read somewhere that over 80% of, of most sicknesses are all self-inflicted. You know, there's something you can do to be healthy. Uh, Judy O'Leary is going to be holding a health intensive at Gilead, and I hope you make it to that. It'll be coming up in April. Uh, she, she knows so much about getting people healthy. I had her come and speak to our staff, and it was riveting to hear what we can do to make ourselves healthy to present sickness, common side effects. I think people miss that there are some very uncommon side effects to worry. Worry and fear, there's nothing common about what that brings you. If, if you choose to go down the path of worry and fear, the side effects are you, your immune system gets shot. The side effects are your blood pressure rises. The side effects are that you actually cause, as Dr. Karen Leaf says, brain damage that toxic to your brain. It actually creates grooves in your brain that she calls brain damage. So fear, that's why we said last week, when it comes to worry or fear, we have to say no and it has to go. Can't do that. When news had come to the king of Judah, Judah's palace about an attack that was coming, Isaiah 7, 2 and 4 says this. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear. Like trees shaking in a storm, but the Lord spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said, tell him to stop worrying. Tell him to stop worrying. He doesn't have to fear. And this is a word from the Lord for some of you today. The Lord says, hey, stop worrying. You don't have to fear. When you cross that line of faith and you entered into God's kingdom, that means you're at a place that you don't have to worry. Does it mean bad things never happen? Absolutely not. That's not even real life. But what it does mean is, is you don't have to worry. The Lord will take care of you. That's what that means. Stop worrying. You don't have anything to fear. Psalms 112, 4 and 7 says this. Light shines in the darkness for the godly. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to take care of them. Hmm. Don't worry. Pastor Paul said, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. You can pray personally. I hope you pray personally every day. Tell God what you need. Talk with the Lord. And join us. Every Wednesday night, we have a prayer gathering that I think is the most important meeting we have as a church family of the entire week. And I encourage you to join us Wednesday night. Don't worry, pray. And then thank the Lord for what he's done. When Sarah was a little girl, uh, she had a loose tooth. And it was just, uh, you know, I've, t I've told this before. She was just dangling. If you were here, you were just dangling by, it looked like just dangling by like a thread. And she kept using her tongue to poke it out. It looked really creepy. And uh, I said, honey, would you like dad to help you? Because it was hurting her too. It was really, it was hurtful. And I said, well, honey, let dad help you. And she said, sure. And so I grabbed some fishing string and uh, 
I had seen it done before. You, you tie it on a tooth in the doorknob. So I thought, well, I've, it's so loose. It, I'm, I'm confident that it's going to come off. You know, it's got to pop right out because it's just, dang, just dangling there. So I tied, never had tried it before. Sometimes you just got to try some new things, right? <laughs> so I tied it around her tooth and I tied the doorknob. I measured it just right. And, and I, I explained to her, I said, honey, trust your daddy. I love you. And I, I, wouldn't, I would not do anything to hurt you. I'm just, well, here's what's going to happen. I've seen it. You slam the door, the tooth's going to pop out just like that. Daddy, you should, yeah, trust me. So we, we slammed the door and Sarah's just went, just, it just took her with the door. She kind of jumped over and she starts crying and it hurt. It, I felt so bad that I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't want to hurt her. I thought, for, I really thought, I believed it would just come right out. And uh, so she cried and I, I comforted her and then I asked her, can I, can I try it again? Can I, <laughs> I really, I wanted to help get that thing out of there. It was bothering her. And so she let me try it again. I dried the tooth all off and I, I thought maybe it just wasn't, I tried it again. I tied it on there. Second, same thing, second time. And she's bawling. I, I tried, dried, I tried just yanking. I could not get that thing out of there. And uh, I felt bad. I'm over it. Sarah got over it. Everybody's good. Uh, but the reality is uh, sometimes even the people that love you the most hurt you. Sometimes uh, it's safe to say with all of us that uh, somewhere, someone over the course of your life has hurt you. Um, you found yourself, it's for some, you found yourself in a whole season you never wanted to be in. And if you found yourself in a season you've never wanted to be in, or you found yourself being the one that somebody, in some cases, it's, it's even the people that really love you, have, have hurt you and done you wrong, I want to encourage you today that there is hope for you in Jesus. Hope is for all of us. Hope is for every one of us today, and God has some hope for you today. If you've had someone do you wrong, there is hope for you. I've sat in funeral homes, and I've, I've watched moms and dads cry uh, over a, a teenage daughter who was killed by a drunk driver. And, and I've watched them cry why and, and, and somehow want to answer for why, why did this tragedy happen? Uh, because somebody drank too much, it took her life. Somebody died. And the reality is for, for some of you today, um, it's not that, but it's, it's somebody who said too much somebody who demanded too much, somebody who neglected too much that caused part of you to die. And I want to encourage you that you don't have to stay that way. Like there really is hope for you. I've watched people that have been hurt years ago and they desperately needed hope, but they held on to the hurt more than the hope. And it resulted in them being an old person who was bitter in pain and still in pain to this day. And I'm just telling you, it doesn't have to be that way. You, you can experience so much healing and so much hope that not only are you healed and not only do you personally experience hope that God has for you, but you can become a hope giver. You can become what Paul said, where you are so full of hope and so full of joy and peace that you overflow with hope and you become a, a hope giver to other people. And that's my desire for you. And I pray today that every person that has been done wrong and every person that has been hurt, that God would stretch forth his hand today with healing power and heal every person who has hurt you. The apostle Paul found himself in a place that he never wanted to be. Uh, somebody else had done him wrong and put himself in a harmful place. He was on a ship on the way to Rome to stand before Caesar and everything seemed fine until we hit Acts 27, 14 and it says this, the weather changed abruptly and a wind of typhoon strength called the Northeaster caught the ship and blew it out to sea. Verse 20 says, the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. Raised for many days. Can you even imagine that? Many days blotting out the sun and the stars. There's no light. The, the, the constant 
rain clouds have taken away all light, so much, so much so that it gets to the point that Dr. Luke recorded these words, all hope was gone. What a horrible place to be. I mean, this is Dr. Luke, one of the disciples who traveled with Jesus, who had been part of so many great miracles. He himself writes, all hope was gone. Have you ever been in a spot when it looked like all hope was gone? When it looked like there's no way this thing can turn around? When it looked like there's no light at the end of the tunnel? If you've been in a place that Paul was, we're gonna, you're gonna, I want you to listen closely today because you're going to discover some hope that God has for you to experience right in the middle of the storm you're going through. The hope for all of us is that there is a God in heaven who knows how to calm calm storms. The hope for all of us is that there is a God in heaven who loves you deeply. The hope for all of us is there is a God in heaven who knows how to carry us through the storm, who enables us to walk over the storms of life that we face. That's why we say you're going to get through what you're going through. Winston Churchill said this, when you're going through hell, run. And I would have to agree. (laughs) You know, when you're going through the storm, it's not a place you want to stay at. You want to get through it quickly. How can you get through it? How can you get through that when you found yourself hurt and you're in need of hope? When you find yourself in a place where sometimes it even feels like all hope is gone. Number one, forgive. Forgive. Sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of a storm because it's the result of our own decisions. We have chosen to step out of a loving God's protection. We've chosen to walk away from what God has said and what he has spoken because we've decided we're just going to do it our own way. And so we've walked away from the protection of a loving God and we find ourselves in a storm as a result of that. Sometimes that's the way it is. Other times we didn't ask for a storm to happen. It just came knocking at our door. We didn't ask for things to to be said or, or to take place, but they did. And when that happens, when you didn't ask for somebody to do you wrong, when you didn't ask to be hurt, but it happens, that's where you have to learn how to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, how to forgive. St. Augustine said, if you are suffering from a bad man's injustice, forgive him, lest there be two bad men. I mentioned last week that uh, during the summer months, we love to go on family vacations to northern Michigan. And I had... uh, taken my family, the same spot that I went to as a kid growing up. And uh, we were one day walked out into the woods and we were walking around the trails that I walked on, the same trails that I would catch frogs and snakes and turtles, that same trail. And so me, Renee, and Sarah are walking along these trails. And you know, it was beautiful. We saw a deer and uh, we, we saw a giant turtle that was sitting right in the middle of the path. And it was really a great experience. Then we got off of that path and I just, I didn't recognize it as much anymore, but we kept walking out into the woods, and, and that's when we started, we started to hear gunshots. It's a little disconcerting when you're walking in the woods and you hear a gunshot, and that's when my eyes landed on this sign that said, bullet impact area. Shouldn't it have just said, run, get out of here. Apparently, we had, we had gotten off, we got on the wrong path, and we got on a path that led us right into a sportsman's club where guys were doing target practice. When someone has done you wrong, you have a choice what path you're going to take. And any time you choose a path other than the pathway of forgiveness, you're in dangerous territory. You can choose the, the path of rejection. You choose, I've been rejected, so now I'm going to walk down this life of being rejected, so now I will reject everybody else before they have a chance to hurt me again. So you spend your whole life rejecting other people because you don't want to be hurt again. You can walk down the path of anger and bitterness. You can walk down the path of revenge, the get even path, and be determined you're going to make them pay for what they did to you. And if you do that, you're constantly reliving the hurt that was done to you. Or you can choose 
to walk down the pathway of forgiveness. You can choose that you don't want to be tied to your past and you're more concerned with getting on with your future, so you're going to forgive. Do you know that forgiveness releases you? Matthew teaches us that freedom, in Matthew 18, freedom releases you from a place of torment. And when someone has done you wrong, there's torment that you're tied to. And forgiveness is what can release you from being tied to the torment of what has been done to you. And did you also know that your forgiveness of others is tied to you being forgiven? Jesus taught us this in Matthew 6, 14 and 15 when he said, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. It's pretty intense, isn't it? We have been forgiven of so much that the only pathway that we really ought to walk down is the pathway of giving forgiveness to somebody else. If we would just pause and think about how God has been merciful to us, how we have been forgiven so much, if we think about that, we will always find ourselves being in a position of giving forgiveness to others because we realize what's been done to us, how merciful God has been and kind he has been to us. I love the way Jack Hayford put it when he said, if you find yourself... Uh, needing hope on a hopeless day, forgive everyone who's been trying to ruin your life. If you find yourself needing hope on a hopeless day, go ahead, forgive everybody who's been trying to ruin your life. Forgive those who misunderstood, those who intended to hurt you, those who betrayed or violated you, those who've caused injury to you. The Apostle Paul could have very well played the blame game because way before they got into this storm that blotted out all the sun and the stars and all hope was gone, the Apostle Paul said, we shouldn't take this journey. Now, he was a prisoner. He had to go. But he knew it wouldn't be good. He told him, hey, don't do this. So when that captain decided, I know more about sin than you do, so you be quiet, he could have said, I told you so. Right? He could have blamed the captain for putting everybody, including Paul, in harm's way. Listen, it's easy to play the blame game. It's easy to play the victim. It's always easy to point your finger at somebody else. But it is courageous and it's biblical to forgive. Jesus said this about forgiveness. He said that we need to forgive in Matthew 18, 35, forgive from the heart. That we need to forgive from the heart. That it's not enough just to say the words. It's not enough just to say the words, I forgive. When you can tell by the tone of the voice and the look of their eyes, they're still mad. I mean, have you not seen your kids or grandkids do this? Yeah, I forgive. It doesn't count. Jesus said, you have to forgive from your heart, from your mind, will, emotions. If forgiveness never hits an emotional level, it's not real forgiveness. When we were at a family uh, get-together over Christmas years ago with Renee's family, um, I was sitting down with a cup of coffee. Uh, My nephew, Benjamin, maybe five or six years old, he was just a young kid running around a house, and he ran into me. So it spilled coffee, and I, you know, it hurt. I didn't make a big deal out of it, but it did hurt a little bit. So I ah, no, it's, early. No, it's okay, no big deal. So I'm, I'm trying to clean up the mess. And I heard the parents say, Ben, you need to go ask Uncle Kev to forgive you. And so I was kind of waiting. I knew it was coming. He eventually made his way over to me. And he said, Uncle Kev? I said, yeah. He said, um, you need to be more careful around me. <laughs> I said, oh, well, thank you, Ben. Thank you. Now I, thank you. I'm aware of that now. I will certainly be more careful around you. Thank you. Um, That doesn't really count, you know. The parents knew that didn't count. I knew that didn't count. It's a calling to forgive from the heart. You can't, we, we can't even do that right without the Holy Spirit's help. How do you know you've forgiven someone? When you stop talking about it. When you stop rehearsing it in your mind, in your heart, in your head. I'll tell you, when you know you've really forgiven someone, when you actually do something to bless them. 
Didn't Jesus say, do good to those that do you harm? So you can do that. You may never have the, the chance to even see that person again that did you harm, but you can do them good. You can speak words of blessing over them. It can be a verbal blessing. You can verbally bless them. That's how you know you've really forgiven someone when you've forgiven them from your heart. Thursday evening, I had the opportunity. There's a young man that I mentor that I met at St. Vincent's Home for Children, and he now is staying at Sunny Crest Youth Ranch. And, and, uh, so I went over there Thursday night, our night to meet, and when I arrived, I noticed he and some other boys, they were out playing basketball, and I didn't want to pull them away from the game, so I thought, I'll just, I'll just watch. I wasn't going to play because I'm really not a great ball player. Like, they wouldn't want me on the team. So I just started encouraging them. I'd hear them say their names. I didn't know all the kids, but when I heard their name, when they'd go to shot, get a good shot, hey, Tavon, great shot, or Doug, great shot. And, and I called their names and just encouraged them. But I couldn't help but think, standing there, thinking, here's all these kids. They've got big smiles. Um, and yet there's got to be so much hurt there. Big smile. They're laughing, playing ball. But how did they get here? That's what I was thinking. What's the story behind the smile? What, what's, this, what's, what's going on in that, that young man's heart when nobody else is around to play basketball? I've found that uh, everybody has a story. You know, some of the stories that come out of there are absolutely horrific. And some of the stories that you've lived in the past and some of what you're living today is horrible, and you desperately need hope. And I'm telling you, friend, you are in the right place at the right time. Because every time we gather, Jesus is right here in the midst of us. And he is the author of hope, and he has hope for you today. So number one, forgive. Secondly, to experience hope when it looks like all hope is gone, Hold on to the hope of God's word. The only way that Paul made it through what he was going through is because he had a word from God. It says in Acts 27, 24, last night, Paul said, last night an angel stood before me and said, don't be afraid for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God has granted safety to everyone traveling with you. Last night an angel stood before me. Don't be afraid. You may never have an angel stand, you may, but you may never have an angel stand beside you saying, this is what God says. But I'm telling you, friend, every one of us, we have the ability to hear God's voice and every one of us have God's written word. And if we don't, here's the thing, if we don't know what God says, when tragedy knocks on our door, and it's not a matter of, of, of uh, if, it's a matter of when. And when tragedy knocks on our door, if you do not know what God has to say, you find yourself in a place where there is no hope, where it looks like all hope is gone because you don't know what God has said about what you're facing. This is why we must be students of God's word. We must regularly be people that, that read and study God's word. I want to get what God has to say on the inside of me. So when tragedy comes, what comes out of me is what God has to say about that. Right? That's where the disciples went wrong. When they too were in a storm, in a boat with Jesus, and Jesus said, we're going over to the other side. And remember how this happened? Then a storm happened, and the disciples said, we're all going to drown. So when Jesus said, after he spoke to the storm and said, be calm, and then he said, oh, you have little faith. The problem with their faith was this. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. They said, we're all going to drown. See, if you, don't, if you don't hold on to what God has said, all, all you have, you are at the mercy of all you can see. And if it doesn't look good, you find yourself in a bad spot. So we must be people that hold on to what God has to say. When you're holding on to the hope of God's word, uh, you're turning your eyes away from the uh, devastation and onto the destination God has for you. Every time you choose to hold on to God's word. Hebrews 10.23 says this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted 
to keep his promise. What are you holding on to today? For what you're currently going through, what is it that you're holding on to? I've found that if, if you're holding on to um, an attorney to fix things for you, to untangle the mess that's there, you might be holding on to the wrong thing. If you're holding on to a, a doctor being able to fix and make things better, and I love doctors, I thank God for doctors. We have doctors in this church family. But if you're just holding on to a doctor to make things better, you know, you're holding on to something that is not as strong as God's word, holding on to a person. We have a hope that the Hebrews says is like the anchor to our soul. And that is the hope of God's word. That is the hope of what God has to say, not what everybody else has to say. When I became pastor, I found out that everybody has an opinion. And I'm not talking about this church family. I mean, they're just, there's book after book after book of opinions of what I should do. I found it feels like everybody wants to tell me what I ought to do. You ought to do it this way. You ought to do this. You know, if I did what everybody else thinks I ought to do, we'd be going in circles right now. What I have to do is what God told me to do. And what you have to do is what God told you to do. And you're going to hold on to what God says. You know, in our church family, uh, J, JC, will you please come up here right now? Um, give JC a hand, will you, as he comes? <laughs> JC, uh, some time ago, not too long ago, was told that uh, he had cancer. And he went from life being normal to, to life not looking well at that time. And I want you to hear uh, what JC did. I want you to see what happened, the hope that came to JC as he held on to what God had to say. All right, first off, I want to say thank you, Pastor Kevin, for spreading that hope to me. Thank you. You're an amazing pastor, and I love you. Love you, Jason. All right. <clears throat> so as, as Pastor Kevin just shared, uh, last year I was diagnosed with cancer. And for me, that was an invitation to fear. Not only does the word cancer mean something scary for a lot of people, but for me it means something else. Um, See, when I was 16, I lost my mom to cancer. And hearing the words cancer immediately invited fear, but not for, it's just the flesh side of me. My spirit man said, don't grab onto that. That's not what you grab onto. So I was so thankful that a few years ago that I was reading the word. And I read in Psalms 118, 17, and it said, I'll read it right now. It says, I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. And I stuck onto that. I stood on that. And I had the hope in that. And it gave me the strength to get through things. Just a quick story. I was going through chemo. And if those that have never seen or never been part of chemotherapy, the first few days after chemotherapy, you feel like you've got run over by a truck. You can't do anything. Um, See, my wife and I, we, have a five, we had a five-month-old baby at the time and a four-year-old daughter. And there were times I couldn't even hold my daughter up. I couldn't hold my son in my arms. It was just so just tiring just to breathe. And my wife and I, we would occasionally go to the mall or do something to get out, to live life normally. And I went to the mall one day, and I looked into the mirror. And in that mirror, I saw me. I looked healthy. I looked whole. I had a little less hair, but I looked like myself. People didn't know that inside I was broken. People didn't know that I was just torn into so many pieces mm -hmm. through the chemotherapy, through all the chemicals that, and all the pain. And then God spoke to my heart and he said, listen, you see that? That's what a lot of people are going through. They might not be going through chemotherapy. They may be going through a broken heart. They may be going through financial difficulties, marital difficulties, but you can pray for them. You can lift them up and you can encourage them with your words. And I want to encourage you guys, if there's any opportunity, any moment to open up the word, do it. I have verses and verses and verses that I share with people whenever they're in, in sickness. Go to this word. 
go to this because it's the truth is in the word and it's our living word. And I want to encourage you with one final scripture here. And it's from Psalms 71. And listen to this. For those that are hurting right now, listen to these words. You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again. And you will lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Then I will praise you with music on the harp because you are faithful to your promises. Oh my God, I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. I will shout for joy and sing your praises. For you have ransomed me, and I will tell about your righteous deeds all day long. Amen. I just want to encourage you guys. God's with you. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you need Jesus Christ right now, my heart's breaking for you. I know you're hurting. I know you're needing hope. Jesus is there for you. Jesus is there for you. And come Come and ask me, I'll pray with you. Thank you. Thank you, JC. I love you, friend. Give me a hug. I love you, friend. Thank you. I love you, brother. Love you. Hey, JC, do me a favor. Will you stay right here? Just stay right down there. Just a minute. Oh, JC, what, what have you been told about that cancer now? Oh, yeah. As of December 7th, the doctors finally agreed with me that I was healed. <laughs> there you go. We almost left off the, the big deal there. <laughs> Love you, JC. Um, I want to pray uh, for every person uh, that, that you found yourself at a place where it looks like all hope is gone. Um, and I also want to encourage those. Um, you know, I, I don't know why, I don't know why it is that some people are, are healed on earth, like JC, and some people are healed in heaven. I don't know why that is. Because some of you are thinking, well, what about the person I was praying for? What about them? I don't know why. I don't know why the Apostle Peter had an angel come and let him out of jail while John the Baptist was beheaded just verses before that. I don't know why. What I do know is Hebrews 11, I believe it's verse 13, gives us this great picture of... Uh, seeing the promise from a distance and going after it. And so what I do know is it's always right. It is always the right thing to hold on to the hope of what God has to say. It's always right to see the promise and then to go after that promise. JC, you saw a promise and you went after it. And, uh, and if you're hurting today, uh, you're, in a, you're in a place where you, you desperately need hope uh, as I said earlier, you're in the right place at the right time today because Jesus is here to give you hope. And just like the Apostle Paul who faced a moment in life when it looked like all hope was gone, everything turned out great for him. Just need that word from God. And the end of the story is Paul was safe. Just as God said, everybody on that ship was safe and all was good. They still went through a storm, but they had hope. And you can too. So I'd like to do this. Um, if, you, if you need a he physical healing in your body, in fact, JC, come over this side, will you? Um, I'm gonna ask, well, I just want our healing team, healing teams, please come to this side over here. I want, you, I want even our healing teams to pray over you. And Troy, come join me, will you? I want our healing teams to just to pray over. We're gonna seal that good word. We're gonna seal that today. And anybody else who needs, if you need a healing, physical healing in your body, stand up right now and just come. We want a chance to pray with you and head right this way. If you just say, Pastor, it's not a healing, but I need hope. I need hope in my life. There's, there's a storm I'm going through and I need it to end. And I need God's supernatural help in my life. I need to start seeing what God's saying. I invite you to come right now. We want a chance to pray with you today. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Pastors, ministers, please come join me up front for those that... Uh, are asking prayer for physical healing. I want you to come help me uh, pray for them. How you doing? Good. God bless you.
me a favor. If you're sitting in there and thinking, Pastor Kev, all's good right now. Um, this is a word that perhaps will be for you on a different day, a word you can pass along to somebody else. But would you right now be a hope giver and extend your hand toward these that are up here? Can we surround them as a church family with our prayers? Can you begin to pray for somebody else? That God would flood their souls with hope today. Before I pray for those that have come for prayer uh, regarding hope, uh, you're here today and you say, Pastor Kev, I need to make my peace with God. I'm not even sure that I'm what the Bible calls saved or born again. Hey, that's the start of hope for you. That's the very beginning of hope for you. So know your sins are forgiven. That you're adopted into God's family. So if you'd say, Pastor Kev, I want you to pray for me. I need to make my peace with Jesus. If that's you, I know how to pray a miracle prayer with you. All your sins can be wiped out. You begin a brand new start beginning right now today. Your life begins to be flooded with hope today. Some have never prayed a prayer to invite Jesus into their lives. Others have, but you've done your own thing and it's your time to come home today. If you say, Pastor Kevin, I want you to pray for me to make my peace with God. Uh, with every eye open, everybody looking around, when I say three, I just want you to wave your hand. I wanna know who I'm gonna pray with, okay? Are you ready? Without any delay, one, two, three. Go ahead and shoot your hand up and wave it at me. All of this, all of this event center, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's do this. For those that raise their hands are being born again, I wanna pray for them first, and we're gonna pray for those who need hope. Repeat after me with this. Will you say, Father in heaven, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe that he died, he was buried, rose from the dead he gave his life for me so I give my life to you I thank you Jesus that my sins are forgiven I'm adopted into your family and I have a brand new start in life that begins right now amen God bless you God bless you Father in heaven, I pray for every person at the sound of my voice that is in need of hope. Not a good feeling, but the eager expectation that something good, not bad, is going to happen. Jesus, we latch on to the hope that you've purchased for us. Yes, God. And I'm asking right now, in the powerful name of Jesus, that you would baptize, immerse every person that came forward and it's at the sound of my voice, you would baptize, immerse them in hope. You would fill them by the power of your Holy Spirit with hope. You would fill them with this eager expectation that something good is coming their way, that all things are possible with God, that nothing's too difficult for Him. And Lord, I pray that everything that the enemy has meant for their bad, for the bad of their family, the bad of those they love. I pray that everything the enemy meant for their bad, that God, you would turn it all around and use it for their good. I pray for testimonies, stories of your goodness to come out of this. I thank you, Lord, for blanketing them with your peace, with your smile, with your favor, and strength from your kingdom. I ask this and I speak these as blessings in the powerful name of Jesus Christ.